Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sanket Pisat and in this video we are going to look at a case of subseptate uterus with endometrial polyp and hysteroscopic correction of these two pathologies in the same sitting. So first of all, as is the routine, let us first take a look at the uh, clinical history of this particular patient and this particular patient is a case of infertility. She is 40 years old. She has been married since 6 years and she has multiple failed IUI attempts done elsewhere. Endometrial polyp was detected in this cycle as a result of a stimulation and she was referred from the department of IVF for a polypectomy. Before we go on to the surgical procedure, let's first take a look at what the imaging looks like. And this is the first ultrasound film and you can clearly see that there is a hyperechoic lesion right in the center of the uterine cavity over here which suggests that there is indeed an endometrial polyp. This image of course cannot give us any idea about the septum but when you switch on the color flow you find that there is a good feeding pedicle over here. So this is supplying the polyp and the overall vascularity of the uterus and it does not look like a submucous myoma because there is no um, blood supply from all around as you would find in a type 2 or a type 3 myoma. So it's definitely a polyp and an endometrial polyp judging by the color Doppler and by the uh, ultrasound. Then when we come to the 3D ultrasound, this is what changes the perspective completely. And you can see over here that the outline of the uterus is very clearly seen all throughout. Also the shape of the cavity is very nicely seen. You can see the polyp right in the center. But what you cannot miss or rather just comes to you is this deep indentation of the fundus at the top. So as we discussed in our last YouTube video and also in the endogyne training uh, discussion group that uh, the question always remains is whether this is a subseptate uterus, a septate uterus or simply an arcuate uterus which does not require surgery. So on the 3D, of course we cannot draw it once the uh, images are already been made but you can see over here that this is one coronal opening and this is the other coronal opening and the contour of the uterus is like this and it's like this on the two sides. So these are the two coronal openings. So once we know that, we know that in the 3D ultrasound when at the time of doing the 3D ultrasound the, sub, the objective way to measure this is to draw a transverse line using the ultrasound machine from one ostium to other and we will call this line as the interosteal line. Then what is done is measurements are taken. So we measure the depth of the septum directly below the interosteal line up till the maximum point of the septum and we can call this distance let's say as A. And we measure another distance uh, which is from top of the interosteal line. So from above the interosteal line to the maximum point of the fundus and we may call this say as B. And then if A, the distance A is more than 50% of B, then generally we say that this is a septate uterus. This of course is by the conuta classification. And there is also another classification which is called as the ASRM classification which does not uh, take into consideration the size of the septum in the relative dimensions of the rest of the uterus. But it just says that if the angle is acute then uh, it would be considered as a septate uterus and if the angle is more than 90 degrees then it would be considered as a arcuate uterus. So going by that this angle is definitely more than 90 degrees. So by that classification, you could say that this is an arcuate uterus. Now the dilemma hence remains. So by one classification system, it's one. By the other classification system, it is the other. But not merely looking at classification systems, if we go into the patient's history, then we can definitely say that she does have a shape defect. There is a proven evidence of a failure of fertility treatment. And hence, I would suggest that it is good to correct this pathology rather than continue it, uh, continue doing more and more fertility treatment attempts with this pathology still intact. So with that, we uh, talked to the patient and convinced her 
about the need for a septal incision also along with a polypectomy and here this is another differently shaded film where you can clearly see the cornua at this level and this level and the polyp right in the center. So we discussed with the patient the possibility of requiring a septal incision along with a polypectomy and then we started with the surgery. Now this is an almost, uh, it is a completely unedited surgery. So there may be some unnecessary frames uh, here and there, kindly bear with me. As the telescope goes inside, you are able to see the ostium on the left of the screen, which is the right ostium. One cannot miss this projection right in the center. And here you can see the polyp right on top. So this projection in the center, which is the mound which is coming in between the two ostia, is clearly the septum. And to someone who has done sufficient amount of hysteroscopies, there is no doubt that there is a septum here and a polyp seen along with it. So now comes the question of doing the surgery per se. Since the size of the septum is not very large, you could say even it is a subseptate. Like I said, some people may even argue that it is an acute uterus. We are going to choose to do this entire surgery using only a hysteroscopic scissor. The advantage of using a hysteroscopic scissor is that there is no collateral damage to any of the surrounding endometrium and the cuts that you give are extremely controlled. Some uh, authors do argue that you may have a recurrence when you use a hysteroscopic scissor. But the trick to not having a recurrence while using a scissor is to keep the dissection between the polyp and the um, normal endometrium very close to the uterine wall. By, by saying that, I mean do not leave a bit of the polyp hanging on the uterine wall and cut the rest of the polyp. So we try to be as flush or as close to the endometrial wall or to the uterine wall as possible so that the entire polyp is removed in one single piece. Do not try to transversely cut it into a couple of pieces uh, so that some part of it will still remain behind and you feel you will go in later and remove the rest. Now here what I am doing is I am making vertical sections into the polyp. This is also called as slicing technique of polypectomy. There is another video on YouTube on my channel regarding this same technique. But what I expect is the polyp seems to be quite large to come out through the internal os. That is where it will find the maximum resistance. So I am going to cut this polyp into two or three smaller pieces and then the individual pieces should be easy to grasp and remove through the internal os by using the hysteroscopic grasper. So the polyp has been divided into two or three parts and now we are cutting off the base of the polyp so that the polyp can get detached. The difficulty always remains in polyps which are attached to the fundus rather than to the anterior and posterior wall because it is a little difficult to reach up till the base of the polyp. So here also you can see I am cutting the polyp off right from the base. Some very small uh, millimeter sized tags may remain though I am uh, trying my best to uh, cut it off right from the base and see that nothing remains behind. A very small amount of tissue remaining behind is really of no consequence. The body takes care of it and there really is no recurrence after that. However, if you cut the polyp in half and leave half of the polyp behind, then there is a possibility that there may be a recurrence. Of course, it can be said that with any technique, recurrence is always a possibility because finally the growth of the polyp depends upon um, the estrogen hormone which we cannot block completely and permanently. But having a good surgical technique may just reduce the incidence of a recurrence which one faces after the polypectomy. So we keep cutting and as soon as the polyp is detached, the polyp starts moving. So the polyp starts freely floating inside the uterine cavity and for the surgeon that is one of the indications that the polypectomy is now complete. So we are cutting, we are still cutting at the base. I am trying to remove whatever tags of tissue that I find attached to the uterine wall at this point of time. It is also important to have a good and sharp hysteroscopic scissor to do this job. Otherwise, you find that you are cutting too many times and the same strokes are doing exactly the same thing again and again. So now I am at the base of the polyp. I think the polyp and its pieces have already been detached but I am just taking out smaller areas of the uh, tags which have been left behind and here you can see the polyp has now started twisting violently 
or turning violently or you can call it dancing also and this is an indication that the polyp is now separated now another polyp small polyp is noted close to the left corneal area and we are going to deal with this as well again the scissor is positioned right at the base of the polyp and the polyp is cut off using the hysteroscopic scissor this is a very small polyp so i believe it will just come out with the flow of the normal saline that we are using for distension but if you want to be able to grasp this polyp and take it out then a good idea is to not cut it entirely but to just hold it with the grasper and pull it out so that you get a good tissue biopsy in either case this is done now and the polyp has been uh, completely detached so i am going to probably take out the polyp now and then we will look at doing the uterine septum as we go into the uterine cavity uh, one sees that the polyp is still there that means the parts of the polyp are still there so if required i may have to hold it with a grasper and take it out but mostly now this looks like these are just tags of endometrium near the uh, base majority of the polyp has already been removed or rather you can say that it has gushed out with the flow of the saline so these are the small tags of tissue that are remaining behind and these tags of tissue we are going to cut them off so these tags of tissue get cut and uh, the polyp we can definitely say is now been completely removed these are smaller tags of endometrial tissue that are remaining behind and uh, these are going to be cut off to make way for uh, the uh, septal incision so now we concentrate on part 2 of the surgery and that is going to be the septal incision so the septum is uh, as we discussed before this is a subseptate uterus and there isn't too much of inward projection so cutting with a hysteroscopic scissor will also serve the purpose uh, here again i am going to i am cutting off more of the base of that uh, polyp which i had cut off initially and now we are looking at the septum which is there on the inside now this septum uh, we can see that this septum is we are going to start cutting the septum right in the center midway between the anterior and posterior walls one good idea to uh, cut the septum is that one does not ever deepen the septum right in the center one cuts smaller parts of tissue or smaller bits of the septum and we move the strokes from right to left direction so we go from one ostium to the other ostium and successively trim the septum in layers the idea for not cutting it completely at one point of at one single point is that it is possible that if you uh, do lose the panoramic view and start cutting only at one point one may cut too deep and cause a perforation so it's always a good idea to move from one ostium to the other ostium and gradually deepen as you go here we are using the simple hysteroscopic scissor the scissor is pushed into the tissue just a little bit and the snip is made using hysteroscopic scissors gives us very good control over the uh, tissue and we can see that the tissue gets cut very nicely and you are able to actually cut millimeter by millimeter as opposed to the uh, the sharp burst of energy that we give in cases of uh, using electricity so both have their own place uh, but in cases of small septa the scissor is definitely easier to use and much faster in working plus there is no collateral damage and even if god forbid there be a perforation we still know that uh, the the perforation is not an electrical perforation so it will only be the uterus that will sustain a little bit of damage which can be repaired easily by taking a suture at the fundus or at the site of perforation but if it is an electrical damage then one knows that we will have to go inside and take a look at the bowel because we do not know how far the current has then spread so i think this is we are reaching up till uh, to the end this is one ostium this is the other ostium and i think the septum part of it has already been done as as the polyp being done so this i think would be called as the uh, end of the surgery and you can see that a good spacious voluminous cavity is now obtained and now when this lady tries for a pregnancy i believe that the outcomes will are going to be definitely much much better so i think that's it for this case if you like the video please click on the icon above to subscribe to our channel and to keep receiving more such updates thank you for your patience and for listening